Hi everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. It really means a lot to me. Um, I'm going to take you through a couple of scenarios, experiences, um, and basically I want you to go away with a thought or an idea of what you can carry in to the future. So I'll just share my screen. Hi everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. It really means a lot to me. Um, I'm going to take you through a couple of scenarios, experiences. Um, basically, I want you to go away with or an idea of what you can carry into the future. So I'll just share my screen. A thought or an idea of what you can carry into the future. So I'll just. Wonderful. Okay. So um, I thought about how I would give this presentation a title. I thought being a disruptor, I'd probably use. So the definition of a disruptor is a person who implement, uh, implements a way of doing things which displaces the existing or the eventual ways of doing. So disruptors could be entrepreneurs, outsiders, and idealists. And I'd like us to think about idealists. I could have used the word ally here, how to be a good ally. But in order to be an ally, there has to be an enemy. And since we are all going through the process of decolonizing ourselves and our minds um, at this really huge moment in time, I decided not to use it. Also, there are so many self-proclaimed allies out there. We need to understand that we cannot call ourselves allies until we are called allies by those experiencing prejudice. So I'd like to start off First of all, give a shout out to all the teachers and students actively wanting to change, doing the work and the most challenging job during a pandemic. Love to you all. It is a hard job. And remember, you are changing lives every single day. So our objective today is to enhance our understanding of how race and racism manifests itself, raise awareness, and listen to the lived experiences of the majority, decentering ourselves, and also compassion and domination. Okay, so shout out also to the team, literally next door, absolutely smashing it. Okay, so let's start off with hashtag imagine. Imagine a world where everyone commits to lifelong anti racist work where the voices of the global majority are, ele are elevated, where everyone continually engages with critical self-reflexivity, positionality, power relations, and privilege and actions on radical solutions that affirm the mattering of the black and the global majority lived and lived experiences. As a linguist, language is key. So please bear with me with some of the explanations. I know privilege pops up a lot and talking about critical race theory, and I'm starting to dislike that word. But let's play around with a couple of words today and a couple of ideas today. Um, there are still so many barriers. So basically, we need to look at these and break them down. OK. So this is me. Um, I was six in this image. I know, I was a cute kid, wasn't I? Um, don't know what happened to me in between, just joking. But remem I remember this day so vividly because something really traumatic happened to me. And as a child of this age, and after losing my father at the age of four, I was made aware of my race. I was made aware that I was different. I think this was when my inner activist was born. I'd like to show you a really short video and the title is So When do you Did You Realise When You Were Black? So I'm just going to start that off. Huh? What? <laughs> when did I realise I was black? 
10 years old. Maybe eight or nine? Maybe like five. I mean, there's like different points in life where life itself was on a battle for a finger at me. So remind, remind me that I'm black like that. I remember being in like year three and some boy called me a nigger and I went home and asked like what that meant. And, he, and then my mom said it means like black slave. And I, thought, and I said to my mom like, why would you call me that? I just secured a place in my local Christmas pantomime. My dad told me he has shared experiences of the tokenistic approval of the black body. He said to me, you know why you got that part? It's because you're black. Going back to primary school, we're playing Power Rangers. No one to be told me who was the Red Ranger, the leader, the best at everything. I was told, no, you have to be the Black Ranger. And because I, I was one of the few white black guys in my, school, in my primary school, they were very serious when they sort of dropped to me. You have to be the Black Ranger because, you know, you're black and that's, you can't be the Black Ranger. We were colouring. And the girl that got a black pencil, pencil to colour me as opposed to a brown one. And then said, but you're black. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm actually black. So primary school, I had this crush on um, a boy. I really fancied him. I told his friend, Danny, and then Danny went and told him. And basically, he came and found me to my face. And he said, why would you think I'd ever fancy a black piece of shit like you? And I was like, okay, you are definitely black. Didn't have my dad around, arguably stereotypical black man or black people in general. So me going into my friend's house, seeing a different family dynamic, thinking to myself, is this because there's two parents in the household? I can't say all black people don't have two parents in the household, that's silly. But obviously at a young age, I've linked my two best friends who in common shared a Caucasian and me where I have just my mum and they both have their parents. Those incidents made me think that I'm different and I'm black. As a child does in primary school or whatever, come back and you tell your parents, my dad wants to be with that parent and be like, oh, what happened to me? And I just spit it all out. So this person said this and this person did that. And it might come to a point where I mentioned, oh, she's so pretty because she has long hair. Well, she's, you know, she's so pretty because she has first hair. And it was one of those things where my dad would come back and be like, but you're pretty because of your dark skin or because of your nose, your mouth, your lips, you know, things like that. But he would always emphasize that black is beautiful. Year four, like, that was, like, the first time I heard, like, nigger and stuff like that. So um, I remember just being, like, really upset. Like, I back then, I, I wouldn't want to be black. Like, I, I used to just wish I, I wasn't. Okay, I know it's quite a strong video to start off with, um, but this is an experience that the global majority goes through on a daily basis. So I'll talk about my first experience of racism, and it was so traumatising, and I remember it vividly. I was in town with my mother, and we just moved to Belgium, and we went to the drugstore. And after shopping, an elderly lady in front of us was really struggling. And I noticed and I remember getting myself ready to help her. Um, she was quite frail and she tried to clutch onto her bag under her arm and she held her cane with the other. And she dropped her purse of coppers. And coppers, how we call it, it's basically all of your smaller Um The coppers were spilling all over the place and surely there was no more than two Deutschmark at the time on the floor. So being the Brit that I am, I went straight to the ground to help this little elderly lady. And this elderly lady, frail little elderly lady, then suddenly had the reflexes of a cat and managed to lift her cane and whack me with it. Actually whacked me. She hit me so hard. And I was six years old. And my mother, the lioness that she is, immediately went for this woman's jugular. What's wrong with you? She screamed. You hit my child. She was only trying to help you. The shock just caused me to cry. And the woman responded, I am so sorry. I thought she was trying to rob me. And the experience, this experience 
has weaved itself into my very fabric. How did being black make me feel? I was reminded of the fear that this woman had of literally losing a couple of pennies. I was mortified. I felt bad. I felt dirty. I felt less than. A feeling that no six-year-old should ever have. And this is the daily experience of the global majority. But what about those on the intersectionality scope? I've got another video for you, really short. The first day I realized I was black, it was 2000. We had just learned about blacks for the first time in second grade at recess. All the white kids chased me into the wood chanting slave. My mother said I refused to come out for three hours, said she thinks I was lost in the trees, but I just needed to be closer to my roots. As a woman, having a boyfriend is a battle. If 70% of us are abused in a lifetime, what is the number of men doing it? The answer is not one man running fast in a flight to complete a mission, and that is what leaves me sick. The second day I realized I was black was at a gas station. I only had 25 cents, so I searched what to spend it on. The cash floated from aisle to aisle. I fixed up my hands. That was the, the first, first time I realized skin, skin color was a crime. crime. My body has become cause to write legislation, cause for ass snacks in the back of a class. My body has demanded everything except respect. I've been asked, what makes you feel unsafe? And I struggle not to yell. Everything. everything. The third day I realized I was black was in an all white cafeteria. I gathered my legs under me, made rockets on my feet, and approached a girl. She told me she was not into my type of guy. I felt the words shoot daggers into my melanin. I have never wanted to disappear so bad. As a woman, I've learned to answer to everything except my name. Little lady is not said to mean equal, but to make sure I remember my place, I battle between wanting to own my body and accepting there is a one in four chance a man will lay claim to my skin, a plot of land for the taking. The last day I realized I was black was in an elevator in California. So the woman that told me she knows what it feels like to be black because she grew up poor. I will tell you before, before you speak, but your mind has got to be bacteria infected. And any filter through that labyrinth of nothingness might be worse than no thought at all. There's a group of women going around the room sharing their personal definition of feminism. He is the only man in the room, and all of a sudden, the tone switches to destroying the patriarchy by annihilating all men. Do you know what it feels like to be black? To pop lock your way in and out of hugs, it is not a problem you want to sympathize. But to tell me you're not paying to stab yourself in the leg because you saw me get shot. We have two different wounds, and looking at yours does nothing to heal mine. Never will I turn away an ally. But when a man speaks on my behalf, it only proves my point. Movements are driven by passion, not by asserting yourself dominant by a world that already put you there. You, you speak to no pain, you, you only find it because we told you it was there. You know nothing of silence until so someone who cannot know your pain tells you how to fix it. Every day is a crucifixion, but there is no regards for lines crossed. I fight so my voice can be heard. I fight for the voices you silence all in the name of what is right. The problem is you a student struggle to attack to a social class. I am black and bold and beautiful by nature. Ain't no income that can change that. The problem was speaking up for each other. Is that everyone is left without, without a, a voice. voice. So, lost voices. I'd like you to remember lost voices. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. This is Christine Cooper. He is a Harvard graduate, an avid bird watcher, president of the Oberdon Society, a biomedical editor, an LGBTQ pioneer, a Marvel Comics author, and finally, a black man. This is Amy Cooper. This woman, Central Park, weaponized race when she called the police as Christian Cooper became a nuisance to her while he was uh, while he asked her to put her dog on a leash. Christian was identified by one singular characteristic, his race. And even though what happened to Christian Cooper didn't result in his death, we need to remind ourselves of the actions of Amy Cooper and what they say about the society we live in today. And more shockingly, People were more concerned with the treatment of the dog than the possibility of Christian losing his life. I have two images here and basically I thought about on what you see when you look at me. 
And I'd like to quote my brilliant mentor, um, Zara Bay, who quoted Audrey Lord and said that black people responding to racism means that they are responding to anger. The anger of exclusion, of unquestioned privilege, of racial distortions, of silence, of stereotyping, of ill use, of defensiveness, misnaming, betrayal, and co-option. Here, we have two images of two very different people with completely different life experiences. So the pain is the same. On the left, Devon is talking about his experiences as a black man in society. And on the right, we have Megan gracefully disclosing her experiences of exclusion within the institution which, in which she is still vilified. She disclosed how she was struggling with mental health. I would also like to quote Breen Newsom here, a writer and activist, and she said, our most significant hindrance to overcoming white supremacy is folks not wanting to confront how Western European civilization is entirely organized around it. It is not some apparent ideology within the West, but rather the central ideology that has informed everything for centuries. That is why folks are freaking out about council culture and feeling that a world isn't shaped solely by the opinions, tastes, and preferences of the white elite. It is an existential threat to civil society. Meghan Markle, a woman proud of her heritage, seeing herself as equal to those at the top of the royal pyramid, is seen as ungrateful. It is important to understand that this system allowed injustices to happen in real time. She was not protected by the media, but she was protected in the media, and it was easily believed when she was painted as a villain. The daily violence inflicted upon Meghan and Harry was met with silence from the palace. This means it is fair game to attack Meghan, as she is N-O-C-D, which is our class, dear. It is one thing for non-white people to exist spaces at the head of white people who like to view themselves as tolerant, benevolent or embracing diversity. It is quite another to have the world that decenters whiteness and I say whiteness with a capital W, we're not talking about skin colour here and I'll, uh, I'll go into that further on in the, letter, in the presentation. It entirely and decouples it from the concepts of normalcy. So, I have a huge movement now. We have reached the break point. It is important to remember that civil unrest does not happen in a vacuum. It is always a response to injustice and the lack of acceptance that a community feels. Rather than just showing rage at those who are protesting, it is important to understand that a system that allows for these injustices to happen is the real problem. And I'll just go to a tweet today, um, which has been flagged up today by our um, activist group. And in the tweet, it says, they just want freedom to say that they want or what they want without anyone questioning it. Like most of their type, if you look around, uh, look, look them up and chop them all tomorrow, no one would notice. Their useful contribution to edu education is nil. They are parasites. This is a tweet which was sent out today by an educator about the black school leader. It has been tweeted and retweeted to a huge following, liked and shared and shared again. These are people working in schools and no one has challenged them. Now ask yourself, why are there so many, so few black leaders and teachers in our systems. The struggle is real. Hashtag racism is not a virus. Hashtag white supremacy is not a pandemic. Racism is not a virus. White supremacy is not a pandemic. Using illness and disability as a metaphor situates white supremacy and racism as passively spreading. These metaphors evade the way that white supremacy and racism are purposely built into structures and strategically enacted. 
Arguing that racism and white supremacy are a virus or a pandemic maintains white innocence, particularly in this time of COVID. These metaphors suggest that everyone is infected, even when they are just breathing air. But this is not how these structures are sustained. Naming racism and white supremacy as a virus or as a pandemic also positions those with illness, viruses and disabilities as de deficit, less than. It can in fact demonize disabled people and automatically makes them more susceptible to harm. This doesn't mean that everyone using dual language pandemics or white supremacy and racism as a virus is ableist or racist. It's not how it works. That simply means that we need to rethink the language we have been handed and ask who it harms and how it sustains power and its structures. So to continue, it is the systemic violence of racism and white supremacy that impacts our daily lives, not just through individuals, but also through institutions. The language of white supremacy and racism as a virus or a pandemic individualizes structures meant to exclude and harm us. I don't see color. Race is such an ingrained social construct that even blind people can see it. To pretend that it doesn't exist erases the experiences of those who are marginalized. People love to tell me that they often forget that I am black or they claim that I'm not a typical black person. And they say this as if, their dawning, if this is their dawning ability to see my blackness was a gift to the both of us. When I point out that they cannot really forget that I am black, sometimes they get defensive or the smarter ones quickly realize that complimenting someone on not being black is actually pretty racist. So they switch gears. I don't see race is usually the next tactic, followed by I am colorblind. And by this, they are suggesting they can never ever be racist because they don't register skin color at all. This ideology is very popular, like a racial utopic version of the golden rule, but it's actually quite the opposite. Color blindness does not acknowledge the very real ways in which racism has existed and continues to exist, both in individuals and systemically. By professing not to see race, you are just ignoring racism. You are not solving it. But this would be an issue if the global majority saw itself represented in all areas and professions of life. So that was a comment actually by a teacher um, and I was actually mortified when I first watched this video. Um, I'm happy to share the link of this interview um, with many different people of many different backgrounds um, and it's really enlightening to see how people actually think and how people are enlightened when they hear the lived experiences of others. Okay. So moving on to the next slide, which is representation matters. And I'm not gonna show a video, it's basically just a link to the TED talk of my mentor and also friend, Aisha Thomas. So when collaborating with other black teachers and mentors, we realized that whiteness was not included in our curriculum diet when we studied to be, become teachers. And my mentor Zara also said that our pathways to becoming educators um, were steeped in so much that it was quite shocking how we were entrusted in the existence, um, our well-being and our teacher training. 
and we all realized that we had uh, that we if we hadn't taken a critical race studies module on our ma courses it would have been quite possible that we wouldn't be doing the work that we are doing today so as, as educators we feel cheated and deeply disappointed also like in my mentor's case whiteness is also exceedingly personal i myself am a black woman but i am also jamaican east indian and german heritage the colonial histories that explain how i came to be are often pointed out but nonetheless traceable through violence aisha thomas was the first black teacher i ever saw in real life and this was in 2017 somebody who looked like me teaching to a class of predominant at a predominantly black school my heart swelled with happiness But I knew that representation matters. And as I was asked to become one of the 26 after some research, I found a 2018 report by the Learning Policy Institute in Carver stating that black and global majority teachers boost the academic performance of black and global majority students, including improved reading, math and test scores, improved graduation rates, and increases in aspirations to attend college. Simply put, black and global majority teachers help close the attainment gap. But that's not all. The report also found that black and global majority and white students report having a positive perceptions of diverse teaching groups, including and academically challenged. But representation politics does not solve the issue. The violence that we have seen by Cressida Dick and Preeti Patel in the UK who happily oversee violence, shows the limitations of representation politics. Having women at the top does not mean that women's issues are going to black faces and high places will also not magically fix all of these problems. We need structural change. This image is an image of a human zoo. And this Human Zoo was in Belgium, in Brussels, in 1958. So if you think about the timeline, it's not really that far away. By the age of eight, going to a predominantly white school, I never saw myself represented, not in school, not in the media, only in roles with negative connotations. For example, on TV, drug dealers, gang members, cleaners, etc. I did not learn about the black and Asian male and female soul contribution. I did not learn about the black suffragettes. I did not see myself anywhere. I felt like blackness had nothing to contribute to the world. So I'm just sharing a meme and an image um, and I'd like to contextualize today's daily violence inflicted upon the global majority. This is Sautia Bachman, also called Sarah Bachman. She was one of the first documented black women known to be subjugated to human sexual trafficking. She was publicly examined and exposed inhumanly throughout the duration of her long, young life. In Bristol, my hair was constantly touched and grabbed without my consent. On the bus, walking through town, cycling, in restaurants, the list goes on. And when politely asking not to do this, I was countered with, well, you can touch mine. Or, your hair, if your hair wasn't that fascinating, I wouldn't feel the need to touch it. I still walk around with a fear of the sudden hand grabbing of my curls. I do not have to explain to you how violent this is. Now, I'd like you to, uh, to uh, think about these two situations. And I'm going to compare them um, through Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hour rule. If you spend 10,000 hours intentionally practicing something, you become an expert on that thing. But here's the catch. Once you become an expert in something, about 70% of that action gets relegated to your subconscious. 
you've put in the hours, you've done it enough, and it becomes sort of automatic. For example, if you were to ask Simone, Simone Biles how she does her jumps and all of those things on that on that three inch beam, she would probably be able to give you about 30% of that answer and why she um, why she has put in her 10,000 hours and how she has become an expert. And when she gets on that beam, her body knows exactly what to do, so it becomes automatic. So what does this have to do with race? So here are some dates. The first one is 19, sorry, 1619. This represents the year that the first Africans were stolen from the continent. The second date is 1954. 1954 is the year of Brown versus the Board of Education. This is the case that was meant to desegregate our country. Uh, sorry, dis desegregate um, the US. So now, for the sake of this, let's, let's assume that 1954, this was in our country, everything was integrated and everything was great. We now know that this is not the truth, but stay with me. So 19, so, sorry, so 1619, to 1954. This represents a span of 335 years. Now, for these 335 years, we intentionally practiced the dehumanization, abuse of, exploitation of, segregation from black people. For 335 years, black people were owned as property and their citizenship, were treated less than were brought, bought and sold as commodity use for entertainment and to disrespect. Now, if you're wondering how that time breaks down into 335 years, this represents 294 10,000 hour units. So our country became an expert, or our continent became an expert in 294 times on the dehumanization of the oppression and the abuse of black people. Now, remember, once you're an expert at something, 70% of the action gets relegated to our subconscious. So if we look around and we ask ourselves why our racial tension is still so high, why are so many parts of our country still so segregated? What is actually going on? If we ask our automatic responses, we'll only be, get, be able to give you 30% of that answer. Now, assuming that in 1954, and legally some things have changed, we've only been trying to do something different for 62 years. So as a community, we need to take the following steps. We need to be learners and we need to take risks. We need to keep the focus on race and racism, any injustice in all areas of segregation, colorism within our communities, the media and the lack of representation. We must assume positive intent and take responsibility for impact because all intentions start out as good but don't always end that way. Expect and accept a lack of closure. The global majority has been warning about, uh, about injustices from the get-go, but unfortunately, change only happens when it affects you. That's not how it should be we should fight together against all injustices. So I'm gonna move on to a pause and reflect moment now. So pause and reflect with me. When I talk about race or racism, I feel, okay, hold on to that. Hold on to that feeling. Next slide. The last time I talked about race or racism was, hold on to that. And the next slide, one challenge I am facing in addressing race and racism is, hold on to that. Okay, we're gonna change this. We're gonna change that feeling, okay? We're gonna end on a positive note. So, 
We understand what racism is. I've given you a definition if, if you need it. But when we talk about race, we do not have to define race because we all understand that race is a social construct by a classification of group membership has been decided by the people within a particular social system at a particular historical moment. It is not a biological fact. We know scientifically that race is not a fact. Race is also not set, it is fluid. And I can give you two examples. For example, in the US, if you're classified as black, you would have to have one drop of black blood. This was defined by government. However, if you are Native American, you have to be full-blooded Native American. Why would the same body of people make decisions of racial categories? Also, political and economic reasons. We need to remember that this is a random system. So why must we talk about race and racism? And we should talk about that as soon as we can. It gives us an initial awareness of race and it begins at six months or even earlier. Children of color, older than five years old, show evidence of being aware and negatively impacted by stereotypes about their racial group. Children should be presented with appropriate, not dumbed down descriptions of the nature and scope of structural racial inequity. And I compare it to smog in the air. Sometimes it's so thick it is visible. At other times it's less apparent. Always, 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 and day in and day out, we are breathing it in. So talking about race and racism, how can we apply a racial equity lens? How is institutional, interpersonal, and internalized racism manifesting itself in different scenarios? So I've split it into three areas, okay? Because there are many manifest manifestations, but there are three larger ones. And the three main ones are institutional, interpersonal and internalized. And they are broken down into these different areas. So we have the school to prison pipeline in the UK and the US. We have institutionalized racism in medicine, exclusions, sets, APs and proofs, free school meals or using the word free school meals, food deserts, red lining, stop and frisk. The next area is interpersonal racism, which is wealth exclusion, microaggressions, multiculturalism versus anti-racism. We also have social exclusion, language, school disciplines, policies, financial aid assumptions. And I've got a really good example here. This is a letter of a social and wealth exclusion dated only 62 years ago. It reads, I am sorry to inform you that we are not authorized to consider a member additions of the Negro, Negro race. And this was literally 62 years ago. We need to remember that it's not that long ago. And then finally, we have internalized racism. And the ideas are, I belong here. Is that really racist? Let me show you what it is. And that is um, also uh, evidence through um, mansplaining or white splaining racism, for example. Owning versus renting, code switching, and having all the answers. I'd like to move on to a proverb here, an African proverb. And it says that the child who is not embraced by the village will burn down to feel its wealth. 
And the proverb basically means that all people, particularly children, are in des desperately need of connection, love, and community. And if these aren't met, they'll cry out for help or even resort to destructive behavior. Hashtag intersectional invincibility. So during my PGC training at Compre Comprehensive School, it was mandatory to attend CPD on how to deal with racism at school. It was always white led. This school had three members of staff from the global majority at the time. And my gut feeling told me that we were possibly experiencing the same. The same school that had a year 10 student called me the N-word, who was then fixed term excluded to return again to verbally abuse me again. But I had a banana skin thrown at me through a window to be told that there were no racist intentions by a white cis male who was safeguarding need and a white cis female mentor who ridiculed my colleagues for their accent and called me aggressive for apparently using a teacher look. It is a favorite trope used to silence the members of the global majority. Intersectional invisibility is what causes the global majority to keep their cool when confronted with daily violence or microaggressions to keep their jobs, or how justified anger is deemed an unprofessional or inappropriate response. This everyday racism is having a profound effect on our health, physically and mentally. So what can we do? What strategies could we apply to the short or long term? We have the murder of Sarah Everard, which was countered with kill the bill. There are lots of factors to blame why protests suddenly become violent. 5,000 or more people marched peacefully through Bristol yesterday. It started out beautiful, beautifully, but things then turned violent. The police responded with riot police, horses. Again, the police have handled this so badly. A violent protest fighting against a bill that makes it illegal to protest. I literally have no words. Black Lives Matter versus the Virgil. We have thugs compared to people who are seen as powerful about how both have been portrayed in the media. So we need societal change. It is desperately needed. We need to be vigilant of the mainstream media having you fearful of others when you really should be worried about whiteness having a bad day. Imagine attempting to humanize someone who chose not to see the humanity of others. And this is why I'm a member of a number of grassroots organizations, no exclusions, CARE, which I am co-founder of, and the Black Educators Alliance. This year, we called for a moratorium on school exclusions. It is really important when you see injustices to fight against them. And I'll give you some ideas. So what else do I suggest? Positive psychology movements. During my MA, I came across so many amazing thinkers and futurists with amazing concepts. Dr. Jay McGonigal, Sonia Renee Taylor, and the Black Women's Manifesto and the Combahee Collective, to name a few. Using the research from positive psychology movement, Dr. McGonigal argues that games contribute powerfully to a human's, ha uh, to a human's happiness and motivation a sense of meaning and the development of community. Right now, for those gamers out there, as a ludologist, I am a gamer as well, yes I am, we spend three billion hours a week playing online games. Yes, it is a lot of time to spend playing games. Maybe a bit too much, but considering how many urgent problems we have to solve in the real world, this could be something positive. According to McGonigal's research at the Institute for the Future, she realized this is actually the opposite. Three billion hours a week is not nearly enough gameplay to solve the world's most urgent problems. She believes that if we want to survive the next century on this planet, we need to increase that total dramatically. 
So if you calculate that, we need 21 billion hours of gameplay every week. It's probably a bit counterintuitive. <laughs> I'll say it again. Let that sink in. If we want to solve problems like hunger, poverty, racism, climate change, global conflict, obesity, I, uh, I truly believe in her idea that we need to play more games. And I'll give you a game now. So bringing this back to Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, and the 10,000 hour rule, okay? This is the 10,000 hour theory of success. We can master 10,000 hours of effortful, effortful thinking, tests and challenges. We will be virtuosos at it, if you think at it. We'll be as good as the greatest people in the world. And so, if we look at it, it's an entire, entire new generation of young people that could virtuoso gamers. And uh, what if we challenge ourselves and go on an epic quest with our friends, our communities, and our society? We live in a society where we have assigned value to bodies on a multitude of levels, right? So look at it. Think about it. Just in your mind's eye, okay? Right. I'd like you to picture a ladder. Now I'd like you to think about identities. Think about the ways of being, our different bodies, and then plug those bodies into the social ladder. You might not have to believe it. This is an idea. Okay, so. We are so opposed to all of these ideas. We need to really work on our unconscious beliefs and biases because this is half of the problem. Society tells us constantly that there are always better bodies and to have a better body. So if we play the ladder game, imagine the ladder, position yourself on that ladder, okay? What bodies are at the bottom of that ladder? Is it time to pass the mic? We are so used to comparing bodies, better bodies based off race, better bodies based off size, better bodies based off age, better bodies based off gender, better bodies based off sexual orientation, better bodies based off class. You can put them all on that ladder. Imagine that ladder. Now, what I want you to do, imagine and think who might be at the bottom of this ladder. What bodies are at the bottom? Just think about it. Can you see who is below you on that rung? Are you taking up too much space? Think about those bodies that you don't think about on the bottom of that ladder. Because here's the kicker, if you want to figure out whether or not you are taking up too much space in the conversation, potentially, all you have to do is play the ladder game. Who is experiencing this more impactfully than me? Is this because they are lower on the rung than me? Who are these people? Because these are the people that should be talking right now. That is how you decenter yourself. It is so, so easy. And today's world, individualism, can make it really, really hard. But it really doesn't have to be that difficult. It's difficult because we cannot get outside of ourselves and our self-absorption. So like Tetris, okay? Imagine it like Tetris. Because this is how I thought about it. I too need to decenter myself and decolonize my mind, as there are always, there is always someone having an experience that is more challenging than my own because they are lower on the rung. So, if we're going to talk about experience, if we are going to dismantle something that we can't dismantle, we need to dismantle it from the rung below us because there are people below you. We have to dismantle it from the lowest rung. 
So inside colorism, for example, it means that we have to start with the darkest people. We need to start with the biggest people. We need to start with the most gender non-conforming. We need to start with the most gender outward people. We need to discover the most disabled people because guess what? If you dismantle the road for them, the rest of the ladder falls down. It's physics, guys. It is the base. It is holding up that struggle of injustice. If you compare it to Tetris, your, soon, your screen will soon be overflowing with injustices. You need to break it down row for row and the rest will collapse. It's really not that complex. The whole when I am free, everybody is free does not work. It does not work. Because you will look at your own area of domination. And if they are brutalizing the group below you, you can be sure that you will be next in line. So if we're having a conversation about colorism and you're higher up on the rung in the social context of the world, then you need to look at centering the voices of the people that are more adversely impacted. And the same goes for any other ism. If we destroy the foundation of the people at the bottom, the whole thing collapses. Imagine the structure. What row are you? Is there a rung below you? And what actions can you insert in your day-to-day -to, -day to remove that bottom row? So people romanticize their plans but dread the execution. The pandemic, the weaponization of whiteness, and I say whiteness with a capital W, and the death of George Floyd are all exacerbating the profound impact of racism of marginalized groups, particularly the global majority. If we think about the Romani Gypsy group, Everything that they have experienced so far during this pandemic is absolutely horrifying. But their voices are never raised. I really hope that this ladder game has contextualized something for you. And it is something that you can do every day. This is a game that you can play every day with anyone you like. Figure out where you are on that ladder of hierarchy and allow those people below you to shine. And get what you have and speak in the places where you speak and work in the places where you work and have the opportunities that you have. That's it. That is literally how it works. Anti-racism must be consistent. No performative gestures, no black or yellow squares, no, re no, <sighs> no performative statements. We need real tangible actions. And if you have time to offer to the causes, fundraise, elevate the voices of those below you. It's so key. How else can you fight against any injustices? You have watch to donate opportunities. So now let's turn this into a game where we can actually collect XP. I love Duolingo. Duolingo is like one of my most favorite apps in the world. So if you think about it this way, you could break it down into your daily XP and your long-term XP. You get 10 XP every single day when you breathe, when you are confronted with people who are unwilling to affirm those that are effective. Do inquiries, continue the conversation, Intervene when you see injustices. Apply a racial equity lens. And you get your bonus long-term XP for educating yourself. Talking about race and the impact of systemic racism on a community. Analyze school structures through a racial equity lens and be proactive and build alliances. So, at them in the future, what I'm hoping it will look like, I hope it will be every day, accessible, visible. It will be seen the whole movement and not just the peak, not just a black or yellow square, not just a hashtag, a spark, a protest or a death, but all the highs, all the lows, collaborating, recovering, healing and resting and everything that happens outside of that. It will be hearing the voices of everyone those silence and those who are spoken over. So what are you taking away from today? 
As I conclude, I'd like you to go away hopeful for the future. If we play the ladder game every single day and all day, we will actively change deeply rooted ideas and bias and replace these with more positive ones. There is a lot of amazing work going on as we speak, but there is still so much to do. And I'll just leave you on a last little thought. Teaching is not synonymous with school. School is an institution. Teaching, real teaching, is spirit-led, and it can be anywhere, not just educators. It can be students too. It can be our community. It cannot be confined to institutions. Education is sacred. Schooling is not. Credentials do not make us teachers. Spirit does. Thank you so much for listening. I really, really 